<laughs> well, thanks for everybody for coming out on this wonderful, beautiful day today. <clears throat> We're going to uh, start tonight a, a three-part series, which will be every other week, and it'll be down here at 7 o'clock and two Wednesdays from now. Tonight we're going to talk about faith, in two weeks we're going to talk about belief, and in three weeks we're going to talk about putting God's word into action. Um, it's just been dawning on me, I've been, I've been at this for you know, a really long time. Um, as a young man I had a, uh, uh, a very strong encounter with Jesus and the Holy Spirit on May 11th, 1973, the Friday before Mother's Day in 1973. And uh, I was ministered to by a Jewish man who had come to Christ. He had spoken up at SUNY Binghamton, which was Harper College. I went to Harper College when it was known as Harper College. And uh, somebody invited me to go hear this guy speak. And uh, he talked about his own conversion story as a Jewish man coming to believe Jesus was the Messiah. And he, uh, and he preached that night on Jacob wrestling with the angel of God. And the, 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 what I came away from, from his teaching that night was that he wrestled and demanded a blessing and the angel t touched his thigh and crippled his flesh. And uh, what that said to me is uh, Jacob could no longer rely on his own strength, he had to rely on God's strength. And when, I had, uh, when he came um, two days later when I went to a meeting of believers, which I had no idea what that meant those days, in a, in a college dorm, in a, Delaware Hall, uh, talked with students about living the Christian life on the uh, college campus in the early 70s, which, you know, we just come out of the 60s and in the 70s, it's a, it was a turbulent time in the United States. Of course, we can say now is a turbulent time in the United States. But um, when he got through with people sharing, he said, we're going to end our uh, session today and we're going to stand in a circle and we're going to pray. Now, for me, I never stood in a circle and prayed. I went to Mass, I kneeled, I, I stood up, we prayed the rosary at home, etc. But uh, I said, I came this far, something was drawing me. Uh, I didn't know exactly what it was, but I know it was the Father drawing me to Jesus, because that's the Father's job, he draws us to Jesus. <laughs> Jesus' job is to reveal the Father and to baptize us in the Holy Spirit, and the Spirit's job is to be our paraclete. He encourages us, he, he enlightens us, he teaches us, he rules us. He leads us, he proves us wrong about sin, judgment, and uh, so many different things. In, 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 uh, in, uh, in Greek, there's seven different functions to the paraclete. But anyway, so he came and he said, I'm just going to go around and I'm going to pray for people as the Lord leads. And again, that was a, that was a phrase I, I had never heard before. But I said, you know, I came out of the 60s, I can stand in a circle and I can let the Lord do whatever he wants to do. And when he got close to where I was standing, something issued forth from deep within my being that was not a conscious thought whatsoever. I didn't, I never thought, I never said that before, I never thought that before, I didn't pre-think it, but just out loud it came, and I said, Lord, unless you touch me, I'm gonna perish. And I really didn't know what that meant, but the Holy Spirit knew what it meant, and we know from the scriptures that Jesus came that we might not perish. And when the man came to me and laid hands on me, it's like, 100,000 volts went off, I lost complete awareness of everything around me, and I had an internal image. And the image I had was a heart, and I intuitively knew it was my heart. But the heart was all crusted with bricks and concrete. And all of a sudden, water burst <laughs> through that, and the bricks and concrete started to dissipate. And of course, you know, and then I, I, I remembered, because I had listened to the scriptures going to Mass when I was young, and kept on going up until early college, until I went on some other directions, that Jesus said rivers of living water will flow through your bellies, and he was speaking of the Holy Spirit, who had not yet been given, because Jesus hadn't been glorified. And this, the profound sense of God's presence and his peace, was it, it, was, it was tangible. Um, and something, something really wonderful began that moment. Uh, as I look back at it, it was so overwhelming, I thought it was a complete, a complete deal. But it was the beginning of a complete deal. And so low, low these, uh, that was uh, 1973, so well, that's a lot of years ago, 45 years ago. And I've been, um, I've been being led by the Spirit all that time uh, in 
whatever level of understanding I've had, we all have a level of understanding. And when the Holy Spirit works something deeper within us so that our understanding changes, then our behavior changes, our actions change, our trust in God deepens, um, uh, our courage grows, uh, our openness to do whatever he tells us, the ability to hear his voice deep within us. Now, I've never heard physically the sound, the voice of God speaking to me like a, uh, an external voice, but I've come to recognize those little promptings on the inside, and, I, you know, and I've, took, I've taken some training. I uh, w was under spiritual direction to the intercessors of the Lamb out in Omaha for a couple years in the, in the uh, early 2000s, and one of the first thing they had me go through was a formation program, which is called Hear, Hearing God's Voice, the Ministry of Intercession. <laughs> and so we start to distinguish God speaking to us. And see, a lot of the church um, goes through the forms and the rituals, which are very important, and, and, and they're, they're beautiful and they're correct. But sometimes it doesn't get down deep into the wellspring of our life, as my brother Chester Horn used to say, deep down within us, where it actually starts to become um, the first thing we seek. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom, and all these things will be added unto you. And one of the saints said, when, they, when the Lord spoke of the kingdom, he was talking about the presence of the Holy Spirit. And so, as he keeps on leading all of us, and he's been leading me lately, I, I'm, be, I'm beginning to understand more and more the absolute trust we can have in God and confidence we can have in the, have in the things that he's told us. And sometimes... You know, especially as people who may have gone to church for a long time and may have, you know, if you're Catholic, you've gone to Mass, you've gone to other services. We've heard the words and we know the words and they're true words and they're good words. But the reality of those words sometimes hasn't come in and really driven our life, ruled our life. One of the things the Holy Spirit does is he teaches us, he guides us, and he rules us. That's a pretty strong word. You know, are you ruled by the spirit is, is he the one that's, that's that's calling the shots i mean up until 1973 i sort of knew there was a holy spirit but he had no functional uh reality in my life and i, I was driving the car and if he was there he was a passenger if i recognized him but i started to learn that it was much better if i just turned the wheel over to him now all these many years later, I still try and grab the real wheel once in a while because I think I know what I'm doing. I really can do nothing. By myself, and Jesus says, of yourself you can do nothing, but with God all things are possible. And so we know from what's happening on the face of the earth right now, maybe you would agree with me, you know, the face of uh, evil is blatant. You know, there's no, it's, it's always been there, it's always been vile, it's always been wanting people's death and destruction but it sort of was a little slicker and hiding now there's no hiding it's just there but we have to draw comfort from from the scriptures and i'm going to talk mostly referring to the scriptures because jesus said you're sorely misled or in one of the other translations says ye do err if you don't know the scriptures or the power of god there's a reason why he talks about those two things about keeping us from going astray or being misled and I know probably nobody in this room has ever been misled, but I, I've been misled. <laughs> I went down a lot of blind alleys until I finally hit my head and figured out this is not the way to go, and then I had to work my way back and find out and start again. Charlie. Um, I was heading back, I did my job over at the parish offices, and I was walking back and I was thinking, and my life really was, I was reading it in a book, and Kathy was reading me a book about how superficial it was. It seemed like life was becoming superficial. Right. And and I knew it. And I said I said to myself, I pray a lot. I pray the rosary in the morning. I feel good. I feel good. I said, why don't I say a Hail Mary right now? So I started to say the Hail Mary. And I, I came back to me. The good feelings all came back to me. Just from just saying the Hail Mary out loud. And that's, that's part of what I'm going to talk about in faith today. Um, we look, to David, look to David. David was, David was a man after God's own heart. Now, David didn't start out that way. 
as you, if you know the story of David, David, David did a lot of not good things, okay? Um, you know, he uh, saw a beautiful woman on the, the rooftop. He said, go, go bring her to me. I want her and let's get her husband at the front of the army line so he'll get killed and I don't have to worry about him. Man after God's own heart, right? Well, God sent a prophet to David and, and, and basically read him the riot act through an image and David repented. See, um, there was a call on David's life and David wasn't living that call until he realized his own weaknesses and his own sin. And in, and, and in repenting from that, and, and in, 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 uh, in Latin, the, repent comes the word, from the word repentari, it means to think again. When he thought again about his life, and he, then he could cry, create me a clean heart, O Lord. Establish your right spirit within me. Cast me not from your presence. Don't take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore the joy of my salvation. Then his heart became, became a heart after God. So no matter where we stand, we've all had temptations and we've all sinned. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, right? And that, that's nothing to stop the call of our lives from being manifested. But it has to, we have to understand that call and be willing to listen more deeply until it gets down into our being what God is asking us to do. Uh, Jesus said, I, I, I came to do your will. Okay, and then as I've spoken in some of the uh, recent teachings, there's, there's two places in scripture that I know specifically that it says this is the will of God, and there aren't that many places. I think there's a third, I'm not recalling it, there's two I know of. One is, in all things give thanks, for this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. And another one, it says, this is the will of God for you, your holiness. And holy, holiness simply means to be set apart for God's use. And for too many years, I, and probably maybe somebody else in the room, have sought God, but we loved the world. And we, we, loved, we loved God and we loved the world. And we're playing footsie inside the kingdom and footsie outside of the kingdom. And what it does is it starts to stretch us. And it stretches, when you stretch beyond your flexibility, it'll just tear you right apart and it'll tear apart everybody else around you. So, uh, Mother Teresa of Calcutta, uh, I won't read the whole thing, but you know, one of the, the, the excerpts I, I, I quoted uh, a couple weeks ago, she simply reiterated the fact that we're all called to be saints. And our goal, I would think people's goals are, we want to be united with God forever in glory in heaven, Whatever that means, because it's beyond anything we really can understand or imagine. It's, it's way better than, if you can think about it and imagine it, it's better than that. I think that's a good thing. And we also have been taught by Jesus to, to pray to the Father, um, you will be done on earth as it is in heaven, right? How many people pray to our Father every day? Yeah. Well, we pray that every day. Do we, do we understand what we're asking for? What's in heaven? No worry, no anxiety, no fear, no sickness, no hatred, blah, 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 blah. Also, no taxes, no mortgages, no high gas prices, no anything. It, everybody's going to be perfectly happy. They're going to, we're all going to be filled to the degree that we've emptied ourselves. Somebody was telling me uh, the other day, uh, Sister Faustina in her writings said that if we show no mercy to anybody on the face of the earth, God can't show mercy to us. He wants to show mercy to us. In the Psalms, in one place, it says mercy is above all his works. Because she said, if, he, if somebody does just one act of mercy, God can work with that. You know? So we need to ask for the grace to do the things that he wants us to do. So, if we're going to say, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and we know his will is, for example, in all things to give thanks, then when we get in circumstances that are hard, has anybody had or have circumstances that are hard? Is it fast or not? Okay. I think, I think we all probably can say we've done that. Okay. And uh, it is our first inclination. Lord, you told me in all circumstances to give you thanks. I don't feel like giving you thanks right now. I don't know how to give you thanks right now. And that doesn't bother him. We can be honest with him. We can just say, Father, I know that your will for me, for me to give you thanks in all things. Could you give me the grace to give you thanks right now? Therefore, we're relying on him, and he can become the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. And all glory has to go to him, because we know 
any good that comes through us is because we've been touched by his grace and his mercy. Okay? Now, to the degree that we can understand and live that, we learn through mostly the trials and difficulties in our lives. When I, when I first had my adult conversion and the scriptures opened up to me and I read in James where it says, count it pure joy, brothers and sisters, when every trial comes your way, I said, if I could even begin to understand that, at least I think I'm on the way. You know, so what is the difficulty or trial that you're experiencing? You don't have to tell me, you can just, if you're having it, blink your eyes. But in that, you can trust God in his word because he told us to counter pure joy when every trial comes our way. And you see, when we start making his word, his will, our will, wanting to do his word, then he has to come in and confirm his word with signs and wonders. He has to prove his word. That's, that's not up to us. Jesus endured the cross because of the joy that was set before him. We can endure the trials we're going through because of the joy that's set before him before us. So when I'm going through something and I'm not seeing any joy and I'm not feeling any joy, I just go to daddy and say, okay, where's the joy? Show me the joy. How do I get into the joy? And then he'll remind me in the scripture, it says, in his presence is the fullness of joy. Okay, and the joy of the Lord's my strength. So what do I have to do? Lord, would you please give me the grace and help me to understand how to enter into your presence right now so I can experience that joy so I can be strong in the things I need to this day. You know what mother, another thing that Mother Teresa said? You can always tell a Christian because they're happy, they have the joy. And that's what we, we what we should go, you're right. You should go after And that's one that's one that's one thing the enemy ha, has no idea about. The enemy has no love and has no joy. So that that's a great thing. So faith. Faith is the foundation of every Christian experience. It's impossible to be saved, baptized with the <coughs> Holy Spirit, or receive anything from God without faith. So there's a little faith formula we came across several years ago. I add one thing to it. This says, believe, confess, act, and receive. That's the faith formula. I say the first thing is, hear the word of God, believe. Confess it, act upon it, and receive what he has. When we operate in faith, we can expect God to be there on our behalf to honor his word, even as he promised. So I'm looking at every opportunity, and, and you know, the, the, the road that leads to God is narrow. The road that leads to perdition is wide. And so I'm getting, my life is getting narrower and narrower to every thought, to every interaction. Oh, that was a good one. <laughs> to every interaction we have with another human being. Because what are we supposed to be doing with one another? Okay. Corinthians says, set your hearts on love and eagerly seek after the spiritual gifts, especially that you might prophesy. Okay, so love has to be the first thing. And it's not the, just the, any kind of love. It's, it's God love. It's agape love. It's, it's love without looking for something in return. It's loving your enemies and praying for those that persecute you. It's giving to those that ask. Okay, if they steal something from you, you don't ask for it back. This is where the sayings get hard. You know, Jesus had some hard sayings when he said, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you're not going to have life within you. And a lot of the disciples, they left. They said, this is too much. And so he goes to Peter, and Peter sometimes would be a really a bozo, and sometimes he was spot on. And that, it's always consolation to see these great people of faith that are bozos and are spot on, because I feel a little bit more comfortable I can be in the club. Uh, he said, where are we going to go, Lord? You have the words of eternal life. He understood at that point where the path was. Okay. Uh, faith, faith in Hebrews 11.1 1 says is the realization of what's hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So when we pray the creed, we say we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of all that is seen and unseen. You see, there are things in this room that we can see. We can see one another. We can see the tables. We can see the lights. We can see the ceiling. But what else is in the room that we can't see? The Holy Spirit's in the room. But you can't see spirit. It says God is spirit. Jesus became flesh so that we could understand God. Jesus is true God and true man. There's angels and there's saints in the room. 
We're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Angels ministering for the elect of God according to his spoken word. So once we realize that we're not limited to the things that we see, but also looking beyond the things that are unseen, that he still wants to make manifest into our lives. So let's just take faith in regard to healing. Um, I, I've got something wrong with me, and, I, and I'm, I'm hoping I could feel better or be healed from this. My, so it's the realization of the thing that I hope for. I realize that God said in Scripture, in Peter, by his wounds, Jesus' wounds, you have been healed. It's an accomplished fact, okay? Now, healing comes in a lot of different ways, and I don't deny, de, deny God works through doctors and psychiatrists and neuroscientists and all these things, okay? That, that's part of his giftedness. But God is a source of healing, and God also can simply heal. But he heals also through faith in his word. If you look in the, the New Testament, I did a study in the New Testament a, a, a couple years ago, and I read the whole New Testament looking for people that were healed in Jesus' ministry. And there were some people that he, 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 he touched. There were some people uh, that he spit in, on their tongue. There were some people he took mud and put it on them and they got healed. But the vast majority of them, I think it was more than 75%, it was 80% maybe, of people who got healed is because Jesus said, daughter, your faith has healed you. Because he spoke the truth, the word, his word is spirit and truth, they heard the word, they believed in the word, they acted on the word, and they received what he had. That's, that's the formula. Okay? And so when I believe through faith for my healing, I'm hoping, I'm realization of this thing that I'm hoping for for my healing. Now it could be healing of body, it could be healing of mind, it could be healing of finances could be healing of relationships. There's all sorts of healings out there that we need. And, and do, do people need do people, do people need healing? I, I think we all need healing. Okay? So the healing is the source, is God. He's told us that it would happen and we have to come to the point where we think about the things that are above and we Focus on his word before us day and night. We pray without ceasing. Now, you don't get there in one big step. In the Old Testament, it says that they journeyed in stages. In the New Testament, it says, all of us together with unveiled faces, gazing upon his glory, are being transformed from glory to glory in the image we behold by the Lord who is the Spirit. So we can tell that there's, there's stages we go through. Okay, And I think each stage has got to do with a level of understanding he's trying to bring to us that we need to internalize and realize so that we can be free to move on to the next level of understanding that we need. Because we can stay wherever we are from now until the end of time, or at least the end of our time, and it means nothing about how much God loves us. He loves us when we were still yet sinners. But it's got a lot to do with how functional we can be on the face of the earth, especially to our families, the body of Christ, and to the world at large. Can, can we be sources of blessings? And I'm, I'm realizing, Monsignor Esif, who I've re received direction from for several years, had a beautiful talk on temptation during uh, leading up to Easter. And basically, you know, he, he, was, he, was, a, he was a retired exorcist, um, he formed the, uh, the Pope Leo the Thirteenth uh, School of Exorcism uh, about I don't know 13 years ago, and there were only six exorcists in the United States. Last year, they just commissioned 68 exorcists, doing a lot of really really good work. He was Mother Teresa's uh, retreat director and, and uh, confessor, uh, wealth of experience. And when I go to him, maybe for 45 minutes once every a year, or once every year and a half, he just tell me so much truth. And, and what I needed to hear, that it gave me something to work on for all that time. And um, I, I just began to realize that there were things that were in me that were my tendencies, which were not pointed toward God, but were pointed toward being led astray, and we've all got them. 
and they're all different. And it does, and one's not worse than the other necessarily. You know, if your eyes are not fixed on Jesus, they're simply not fixed on Jesus. Okay? And what those things are is we need to know what they are so that we can understand and let God give us a strategy about when that temptation comes, how to be victorious in it. Because Jesus is the victor. Jesus is the conqueror. In him, we, are, we share his, his divine mission. Okay? So, you know, in my particular case, my spiritual director told me I didn't have enough courage. I didn't rely. I relied on myself too much. And, and other members of my family would tell me that I was just really quick, quick tempered. <laughs> and, you know, for a long time, I'd just say, I just say, I'm nuts. But then I started really realizing God is telling me exactly where I need help. And I've been kicking against the goat saying, I'm not going to pay any attention to that. I don't want to listen to that. But because Monsignor Esif spoke the truth and love to me, where I could hear that, I could then look at my weaknesses. Because when, when he told me that, and, I, and I, I said, oh my gosh, he's absolutely right. I don't know, I have no, I, I didn't understand that. I have no idea what to do about it. But the Lord gave me a, a, a reminder of what he said in the scripture. He says, my power is made perfect in weakness. We're always gonna have weakness. We're trying to get rid of our weaknesses. Now we want to meet him in our weaknesses, and that's where his power is made perfect. So I don't have to run away from my weaknesses. I have to meet him in my weaknesses. And so I said to Jesus, I don't have enough courage. I have no idea how to flex my courage muscles. Could you give me your courage? It's perfect. And just knowing what to ask for was a, a, a very freeing thing to me. You know, it just took weight, it took weight off my back. And I started thinking about people in the scriptures and how they met God and got their deliverance. And I think in fact, Daniel's in the lion's den. He was in a real den with real lions roaring at him, okay? But, but they didn't touch him because God was with him and he protected him. So I'm sure Daniel wanted to get out of the lion's den, but Daniel was wise enough and had enough grace to meet the Lord in the lion's den. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Hananiah, Azariah, and Mishael. Three Hebrew boys. Wouldn't worship. You know, throw them into the fire. It was so hot they had the strongest guys in the kingdom grab them and bind them up and throw, it in, throw them into the fire. And it was so hot that burned the guys up that threw them in. And after a while, the king looks in there and he goes, didn't I throw three of them in there? I see a fourth man with them. And they came out of it, and their, their, their clothes didn't even smell like smoke. They, they were willing to go to wherever they had to go to be faithful to God. And in the midst of that, God came and met them in the fiery furnace. And they got out of it. But they got out of it because they met him, and he was with them in the midst of the fiery furnace. Peter was in jail. He had guards all around him. Okay. God wanted him out. The church says the church was praying fervently for Peter. The earthquake happened. Chains fell off. Doors opened up. He thought it was a dream. Let him out, and it wasn't a dream. Okay. Paul and Silas in the, de the deepest dungeon. Okay. The darkest, deepest dungeon. Feet chained and staked. And what did they do? At the midnight hour, they were singing praise to God, and everybody in the whole prison could hear them. They weren't just saying, oh, thank you, God. Thank you. Hallelujah! Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 We have to learn to get it out. It's not... I believe in silent contemplation. I believe in, in, in the stillness and, and, and be, be still and know that he's God. But there's a place for verbal prayer. And, and not just... Many kinds of prayer. I pray the rosary every day. I try to go to communion every day. I read the scriptures every day. I pray in tongues for a long time every day because that's the way the Lord has led me. And I'm just, when I get stuck, I just start praising him out loud. Well, and if I can't praise him, I say, David said in the Psalms, Oh Lord, open my lips that my mouth might declare your praise. Because I'm not I don't want to praise him just because I can open my mouth and sounds come out. I want to praise him because the anointing of the Holy Spirit is upon me 
to issue that praise because it penetrates deeper into the universe than anything we can do of our own. Because again, of our own, we can do no good thing, but with him all things are possible. So there's, there's so many different uh, uh, examples of God meeting. So what I want to encourage you is, wherever you're at right now, whatever you're going through right now, and yes, he says there's a way out of every trial. And, and sometimes you just don't see the way, but it's there. And if you just say, Lord, you said there's a way out of every trial. I'm not seeing it. What has to happen for me to see it? Can you come in and give me the grace to see it? I need to see it. But he's, because he's let me do that in a couple ways, I've got to a place where um, things that would be a very heavy burden on me, you know, some things come through our family lines that are really great, and some things come through our family lines that are not so great. And a lot of great things come through my family line. Some of the things that were not so great that came through my family line is they were masters of worry and anxiety. Okay? And I, and I learned how to do that <laughs> very well. They, were, they had doctorates in it. I don't think I ever got to the point they got to, but I was pretty good at it. Okay? But because I asked for the grace, received the grace, acted on the grace, brought me to a different level of freedom. And in this different level of freedom, I'm beginning to see that the potential for everybody is here because Scripture also says where sin abounds, grace abounds all full, more fully, right? So the world is, you know, the world is in an uproar, okay? But God's not asleep at the switch. You know, I mean, it's, uh, how many more terrible things can we hear? I mean, just the thing, uh, in Texas yesterday, little kids, blown apart with an AR-15. Horrible, 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 okay? I, I guarantee you that's not the spirit of the living God that's driving that situation. But what do we do in the midst of it? We should do the things that are commonsensical, for sure. We can do the things that are rational, because a rational mind is a gift. But the other thing is we can go in and we can do the war warfare, number one, to allow ourselves to become more healed, so that we can be more functionally productive on the face of the earth to the people around us. And do we do it perfectly? You, you might do it way better than I do it. I, I don't, all, all I can do is what I can do and I'm making steps forward and I think I'm better. I'm doing it better than I used to do it, but I still have inclinations, but I know where my help is earned. Okay, so David in Psalm 142, and this is the, one of the things I want uh, to, to function, focus on. It says, with a full vo voice, I cry to the Lord. With a full voice, I beseech the Lord. Before God, I pour out my complaint, lay bare my distress. See. That's intellectual honesty. That's telling God exactly what's going on. Like, do you think he knows it anyway? <laughs> Does God not know exactly what's going on? Does he know every hair on your head? Okay. In my stage in life, it's a little easier for him to count them, but that's all right. It was harder than earlier. Okay. But he knows it. But David knew that he could say it out loud. We need to say you don't, have to, you don't have to say it in the midst of a group. You can say it in the car. You can see it in your bathroom. You can say it in your backyard, backyard. You can say it on a walk. But tell God the reality of what you want, and don't be afraid. It's going to put him off, or it's going to put you in a bad situation. He knows it already. Yes, John? Um, I've been reading about David in uh, Samuel, in the books of Samuel. And one thing I'll say about David, he... He was a murderer. Yes, he was a valiant um, uh, warrior. And uh, he wasn't perfect when it came to women either. But he was one good thing. He always went back to the Lord and asked for help. Yes. When he got in, in too far and he couldn't any other way out, he went to the Lord. And I think that was the thing that the Lord loved about. You know, he always, he always went to the Lord. And, and, and we, we can obviously do the same thing, but I believe we can get to the point where we can be proactive in it, and we can sit still before the Lord, and we let the Holy Spirit reveal to us what's that next thing that has to be transformed in my life so that I could be 
a more fitting image. We're supposed to bear the image of Christ within us. Paul said, in the flesh I no longer live, but Christ lives within me. And since God is not a respecter of persons, if he could do it for Paul, he can do it for Frank and Giuseppe and David. He can do it for all of us. Okay? But it, does, it doesn't come without setting our hearts on love and eagerly seeking after the spiritual gifts, going hard after them. Okay? Realizing that every encounter we have with anybody, everybody is an opportunity for the kingdom to grow in manifestation. Can you imagine that? Every single thing. It's not random. I don't think there's any randomness in the universe, honestly. I mean, scientists say if the, the stars and everything were a fraction of a fraction of a degree off, everything would collide. It's, 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 it's very, very well structured. It's brilliant, you know? And I don't care how smart you are, anybody that gets back to the beginning, they can't quite explain how did something come from nothing? Where did the something come from? Well, our, our faith says that the world was spoken into existence by Christ. So I, I don't know exactly how that happened, but I believe that what we see came from the heart of God. And uh, he loves it all and saw it was good. Except when he made mankind, he says, very good. Okay. Very good. And so we're very good, each one of us. Everybody we see. I mean, even some of the people that you might think, or I might think, are the most da dastardly on the face of the earth right now, God still loves them with all his heart. But, strange as it might seem, there is a sin that could be committed against the Holy Spirit that can't be rectified. People can make a choice. That's why I believe, and the, the saints have documented it through visitations and stuff like that, there, there are people that go to hell. Not that God wants people to go to hell. He says, I want all men and women to be saved and none should perish. But some people, how, how does Satan, who is the worship leader in heaven, can you imagine that? What a good job, leading the music in heaven, and it wasn't enough? He says, I won't serve. He rebelled. And so I said, you know, if a third of those that were in God's presence in heaven could rebel, it doesn't surprise me a third of everybody on the face of the earth can do stupid things. It doesn't surprise me that I can do stupid things. Okay? But God never abandons us. He says he will never forsake us. He's with us until the end of time. So realizing his promise that he's always with us, and he is with us now, and he makes himself available to us, and he told us exactly what to do if you read the scriptures, that's why Jesus said you're sorely in the sled because you don't know the scriptures or the power of God. Um, faith comes from what is heard and what is heard through, through the word of Christ. So the scriptures are very important. Uh, St. Jerome said ignorance of the scriptures is, ig is ignorance of Christ. And again, Jesus said you're, you're sorely in the sled because you don't know the scriptures and the power of God. Um, so faith comes from what is heard and what is heard through the word of God. So faith comes from hearing and believing and then acting on that thing. Okay? We might be faced with a whole bunch of things and a thousand thoughts are going to go through our mind about what we should do about it or in our thoughts there could be the word of God saying, this is what I say about that particular issue. My brother Chester Horner died this last year. I ministered with him for over 40 years. He, he was very, very sincere on following the Lord and, and, and made great strides in his life. You know, he'd say, I'd search the scriptures about the issue that I'm having and what God said about it, and I would meditate upon that, not meditate upon the problem. You meditate upon the problem every which way, and the problem's still going to be there. You meditate about what God says to it and believe it, Ask him for the grace to believe it. Again, we don't even have to try and figure out how to do it on our own strength. We just say, God, give me the grace to believe. Remember the guy, his son was sick, and, and he says, can you heal him? And Jesus says, can I heal him? And the guy said, I believe, Lord, but help my unbelief. He still healed the guy's son, even though the guy said he believed and he, he didn't believe. He was not strong in his belief. We don't have to be perfect in it. If you draw close to God, he will draw close to you. Okay? We just have to turn toward him. And if we don't start turning toward him the first thing in the morning and the horses get out of the barn 
It's really hard to get our focus, I'm telling you. And if you're serious about, you know, wanting to be healed yourself so that you can be a blessing, and you want to be serious about having the people in your family and your life get blessed because they need it, and maybe some of them are going through hard times or illnesses or challenges or whatever else it is. You know, just last week, Brother Michael Pignatelli died. Uh, I won't go through the whole story, but he was in a rehab situation. They didn't know what was wrong with him, really, and we had a little, you know, get a little confusion. And I brought him communion maybe five or six weeks. A couple weeks I couldn't go because they had COVID in the facility. But anyway, the last time I, I, I brought communion to him, the Lord started to instruct me. Just like when I was bringing communion and Joe was in the hospital, I was bringing him communion. The Lord would tell me exactly what would happen when I brought communion to him. He just laid out the scenario. And it would happen just like he said. He said, when you go, when you go to bring Michael communion, tell him, Mike, go through the communion right. This is, you're going to receive the Jesus Christ. This is truly Jesus Christ, body, soul, and divinity. And when you receive him, he's really here, and he will heal you. And the presence of God would come into that, that hospital room so strong. It was just an incredible anointing. And so we were praying for his healing. And so what happened, uh, I think it was last uh, Saturday or something like that, he just was in a chair sitting by the nurse's station, put his head down, and just went home to the Lord. I mean, if you got to go, <laughs> it's a good way to go, isn't it? You know, I mean, yes, it's too soon, but I mean, God knows what he's doing. Maybe Michael understood what he was doing, and Michael cooperated. I don't know how that works, but I had no sorrow in the spirit for Michael. I was sad I won't have a chance to share with him on the face of the earth again. I got another intercessor in heaven for me. I don't know about you. Well, I look at you know, St. Anthony's prayer group's been in, this is our 43rd year of existence. We've had, a, we've had a lot of old people to start with, and a lot of them have died. And I know their lives, and they were holy people, and they went through difficult times, especially a lot of these old Italian ladies, man. I'm telling you, if you want to look for heroes of faith, they were my heroes of faith. I know what they went through, and they always were smiling. They always were cheerful. They always talked about how good God was. And I know their lives weren't easy, you know? And, and you think that as much as they were like that on the face of the earth, now that they're free from all those burdens, you don't think they're just doing a hallelujah dance up there for all of us right now, saying, Lord, just give them what they need. Give, give the grace to them they need. Ha have them open their hearts and their minds to what you got for them right now, this moment, in this, in this room. It's St. Joseph's. What are the graces he wants to give us right now that we can excel in the calling in our lives? Uh, faith is work, faith works through love. Um, it's impossible to please God without faith. So faith is really important. So it would do you well to do a little scripture study on faith. Um, and we're totally dependent on the Holy Spirit. In fact, Jesus said, it's better that I go. If I don't go, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I'll send him to you. Whoever believes in me, as scripture says, John 7, 38, rivers of living water will flow within him. He said this in reference to the Spirit, that those who came to believe in him were to receive. So we receive the Holy Spirit at baptism, absolutely, that forms character within us, and that's really, 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 really important. But the baptism of the Holy Spirit, where we ask him to come in and to bring a fresh indwelling of him, awareness of him, opening the scriptures for, for us, learning to pray more deeply, loving to fellowship, that equips us with gifts for ministry to build up the body of Christ. You know? We need to build up, we need to have ourselves build up, absolutely. You can't give what you don't have. If you're not built up, you're not going to build anybody else past to where you are. And we should be doing as much as we can possibly do because it's good and it's worthy to be done. But wouldn't it be great to be able to say, I have surrendered more and he's widened that riverbed within me more i went to a, a healing mass up in my hometown in lockport new york there's a, a, a kenyan priest there that's that's a spirit-filled priest and um, he does once a month healing and uh, uh healing mass and i got to know him in december and we were sort of stayed in contact but he came out this time he said the mass didn't preach but he, he gave an exhortation before he started praying with people he laid hands on everybody in the church before he left everybody in the church got prayer and, and this is what he said and it struck me he said 
I take my ministry seriously. He says, I pray and I prepare for this. Because I come into the church in the afternoon and I go through the whole church with holy water and I bless the church. I pray that, that the devil won't keep anybody from coming to receive the healing that God has for him. I'm serious about my ministry. And then he said, turned to the people and he said, what are you doing to prepare for your healing? Are, are you waiting for Susie to do it for you? Are you hoping Mother Mary does it for you? Now don't get me wrong. Mother Mary's got me out of a lot of ditches and I love her and she's, she's a big deal in my life. Okay? But she wants me to grow up to be a mature man in Christ, a mature woman in Christ, so we could mimic her spirituality. She just doesn't want to raise a bunch of babies. She wants to grow up some children to become men and women in God. And what did she say to us? Let it be done unto me according to your word and do whatever he tells you. You can't ask for a simpler or a deeper spirituality than that. Okay? Let it be done unto me according to your word. What, is, what does that indicate then? We need to know what his word is. We need to hear his word. Okay? Instead of the thousand things that the world and the flesh and the devil tells us about ourselves, most of which are not true. Uh, has anybody told you something about yourself that was like negative and wasn't really the true, truly who you are? We've all had that experience. And it clamors in our mind. That's why... When we're born again, our spirit is instantaneously translated from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his beloved son. Or as the scripture says, we're born again. Okay, that's a scriptural term. We're born again. Born of the spirit. Translated. The kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the beloved son. But we need to be renewed in our minds by the word of God. Renew, be renewed in the spirit of your minds. So all those thoughts, which are ungodly thoughts, have to be supplanted by godly thoughts. That's why it says, fix your, think about those things that are above, that are holy, that are honorable, that are pure. We've got to know what those things are. And everything we need to know for, about salvation is in, the, is in the scriptures. There's other things, too, that aren't in the scriptures. They can't all be in the scriptures. They, say, or, you know, they, they couldn't even write everything that Jesus did in the scriptures. He did so many wonderful things. Okay? But the, the gist of it is there. And some things would be unfolded and understood as time goes on. Uh, the Immaculate Conception wasn't defined as a, do as a dogma until 1950. They knew it in the early church, but they formalized it. Okay? So Mary conceived without sin. Do you understand, for us to get into heaven, there can be no sin clinging to us? The sin which clings so easily to us? Nothing with spot, blemish, or wrinkles is going to enter into his presence? Woo! Okay? Now, who would like to go from here right into the party? Or do you want to go to the side room for a little cleanup? <laughs> Great mercy to go to that side room if you need it. But I'm telling you, if your life is anything like mine, you probably got enough issues going on. If you face them with love, you, you can go a little bit more directly. St. Catherine of Siena was a doctor of the church. One of only four women doctors of the church. You know how many men doctors of the church there are? Many, many more. I can't believe we don't have more women doctors in the church. But anyway, that's a different story. Catherine of Siena said... If you receive God's love, he will forgive you. But then she goes on to say, if you receive God's love perfectly, he will forgive you and it will wipe out the effect of your sin. I, I never heard anything more hopeful in all my life. Can you repeat that? If you receive God's love, he'll forgive you. If you receive God's love perfectly, he'll forgive you and it will wipe out the effect of your sin. See, none of you have walked through life creating as much chaos as I have. I got a lot of stuff to <laughs> be corrected. Okay? We all have some. But Paul said he was the worst of all sinners. He had a lot. But he got to the point and says, I, Christ lives with me. I don't, it has accomplished on the face of the earth. I don't think Paul had to go to a, side, a time out. <laughs> through what Paul suffered. And Jesus, when he accepted the ministry that God sent to, get, offered him, he took him to the desert for three years and he showed him everything that he was going to go through. Beaten within one stripe three times. Stoned. Shipwrecked. Climbing over walls. Put in the deepest dungeons. He knew it was all coming and he said, yes, Lord, I'll take this you've got for me. To me, that's pretty manly. 
said Catherine of Siena was pretty womanly, however you want to say it. Of course, a woman is just a man with a womb, right? We're all men in that sense, human beings. Okay? That, we're, we're in the same boat, guys. Same Holy Spirit. The same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead. And that's, I, I say this, and Charlie just loves it every time. The same power that raised Jesus from the dead is at work in our mortal bodies. So, you know, when I get a little wonky in my body, and, you know, I'm getting older and my body gets a little more wonky, you know, I do the things that I, you know, I think are common sense. I try and exercise and eat right and this and that and blah, 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 blah. blah. But when that happens, I just say, Jesus, you said by, by your stripes I'm healed. And I think you told me the same power that raised you from the dead is at work in my mortal body. Can that same power do a little work on me right now? Get me a little more straightened out over here? Now, if you want me to go home today, that's fine. I'm, I'm, I, it's okay by me. But if you've got stuff that I still need to do, you just give me the resources and the strength and the ability to do what I have to do. And then when the time comes in, we can agree that it's time to go on, however that works. I don't know. I think we have a decision in that. Honestly, I do, but that's just me. Don't take that as, you know, teaching order of the church. Pursue love and eagerly seek after the spiritual gifts. So, faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. But faith is very, very important. Um, and about prayer, we've, we've learned methods of prayer and modes of prayer and a lot of them are good and I use a lot of them I think there's, there's, wonder, there's many many kinds of prayer that I, I, I love to use uh, St. John Climactus monk, mount, a monk on Mount Sinai he lived in 575 to 650 he says have great courage and you will have God himself be your teacher in prayer just as it is impossible to learn to see by word of mouth because seeing depends on one's own natural sight so it is impossible to realize the beauty of prayer from the teaching at others. Prayer is learned by praying. Isn't that something? You learn to pray by praying. And it has a teacher of its own, God, who teaches knowledge and grants the prayer of him who prays and blesses the ears of the just. So anything that we're going to do, here's the, here's the, the last um, thing I wanted to say. In, in the sense of faith, we understand faith works in the context of love. We need to set our hearts on love. And the love of God in the Trinity has been extremely faithful to us. And it was evidenced on the day of Pentecost because the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit were, were involved in the day of Pentecost and the disciples were involved in the day of Pentecost. The Father was involved because he did what he, what he said he would do. He so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. But God did that, didn't he? He, he offered his son to us. Jesus did what he was commissioned to do. He suffered death on a cross. He set his face like flint toward Jerusalem. He learned obedience through what he suffered. And when, he learned, when his obedience was perfected, he became the salvation for all of mankind. So Jesus came and suffered, died and rose from the dead and ascended to heaven for us. On the day of Pentecost, they all began to speak in other tongues as tongues of fire came on them as they all began to speak in other tongues, as the Spirit enabled them or gave them utterance. So the Spirit's job is to enable us or give us utterance. Our job is to begin. And it's just like it happened on Pentecost. Now, the tongues that they spoke in Pentecost were different tongues. They were tongues of the world used as a sign and a wonder for the people there. That was, the, that, was that miracle of tongues. Okay, they heard him speaking in Greek and they heard him speaking in all these different languages. Okay, that was that, was that miracle. But the, the miracle of tongues as a, as a spiritual gift is unknown tongues. It's, it's, it's tongues not of this earth. And it's our prayer language. And one of the things that happens when you pray in tongues is you utter mysteries unto God. And in Greek, um, the translation really means uh, divine plans. See, there's plans for each of us, right? We, we're, God's got a plan for us. Each one of us has a plan. Sometimes we cooperate with it better than other times. And even if we don't cooperate, it doesn't mean he's abandoned the plan for us. Okay? You just got to get me channeled back onto the right road. And, make, make. and when we utter divine plans, 
those mysteries, those things unseen, it brings them into reality so that those plans for us that God has that has not yet been manifested on the face of the earth can be manifested. I don't know what they are. It's a mystery. But it becomes enfleshed, so to speak. It's just like a version of the incarnation, if you want to sort of look at it that way. And we've got all this stuff that's unseen that God wants to drop into the reality. For what reason? So that we could encourage, upbuild, and console one another. That we could prophesy. That's why he said, seek eagerly after spiritual gifts, especially that you might prophesy. You've got to understand what prophecy is. It's encouraging, upbuilding, consoling one another. Can you imagine if everyone in the face of the earth was doing that? That poor little sad soul that... Anyway, we, we can make a difference. Even if we still have problems, even if we still have trials, even if we still fail, he takes no pleasure.